With all of this in mind, it's no surprise to know that disruptions to the glycocalyx, like shedding due to hyperglycemia or oxidative stress within the cell, can contribute to metabolic disorders, even including insulin resistance. The glycocalyx is present on the plasma or the cell membranes of virtually every single animal cell on the planet, including a bunch within our own bodies that we all care about, like neurons, muscle cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, fat cells, and more. On the erythrocytes, for example, the red blood cells, there is some very a, a unique form of the glycocalyx. We have a very dense, what's called sialic acid-rich sugars that create a negative surface charge that actually helps limit the red blood cells from aggregating and binding together. So it's a way of ensuring that the red blood cells are not connecting too readily and becoming too sticky, lest we start to form blood clots. So the glycocalyx on a red blood cell helps the cells have a little bit of a repulsion against each other. Now, there are instances when the blood cells do start to clot together, but that's beside the point for now. Uh, in its normal unstimulated state, then the red blood cells are going to have a little bit of a mild repulsion to each other, in part thanks to the glycocalyx. Now, one part I haven't mentioned is the blood-brain barrier. But anytime you think of something that is lining a part of the body, including the blood-brain barrier, you can also think of the glycocalyx. It's, again, relevant in the blood-brain barrier. Also, the lining of the lungs. The alveus, the alveolus rather, the alveoli are the little sacs and the alveolar epithelium or the lining of it has its own glycocalyx. And it, interestingly, that lung glycocalyx interacts with surfactant. You might not have ever heard of surfactant if you haven't <clears throat> ever looked at lung physiology. But surfactant is this watery slash oily substance that reduces the surface tension of the alveoli, which makes it easier for the lungs for us to breathe in and out. You also have the glycocalyx in the kidneys to protect uh, filtration barriers and, and more. But today, as I noted earlier, I want to emphasize more on the gut, the blood vessels, and the fat cells because of the interesting metabolic regulation and, of course, because of my ongoing permanent seemingly interest in adipose tissue. Okay, so let's move on to um, part of what the glycocalyx is doing in cell biology. All of that previous ramble was meant to be more of an introduction. The glycocalyx influences physiology and cell biology by functioning as this selective filter for molecules based on size and charge. It also, as I noted, acts as a mechanosensor for fluid dynamics, you know, in other words, analyzing shear stress, and also finally a scaffold for things like growth factors and adhesion molecules. And adhesion molecules are these hormones, if you will, or proteins that are part of that cytokine family, some of which can promote inflammation, others promoting a, an anti inflammatory signal. For instance, the glycocalyx can trigger nitric oxide production in response to shear stress, thereby promoting vasodilation, the expansion of the blood vessels. And it can limit white blood cell adhesion to the walls of the, red, of, of the endothelium. And that can, of course, reduce inflammation. That absolutely would have some relevance to atherogenesis. If you can block or reduce the degree to which white blood cells are binding to the walls of the blood vessels, then you're going to reduce the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. In metabolic terms, alterations to the glycocalyx are linked to conditions like endothelial dysfunction, namely atherogenesis, as well as some impaired nutrient handling. All right, let's get into the endothelium. In the vascular or the blood vessel endothelium, which lines all of the blood vessels, so think of the, the wall of the blood vessel, the glycocalyx forms a prominent layer that extends into the bloodstream. So it's, it's, move, it's pointing in. And the thicknesses can be up to several micrometers to whatever degree you might care about that. In the large arteries and then a few tenths of a micrometer in the smallest of the blood vessels, namely the capillaries. It responds to hemodynamic forces, so the pressures in the blood vessels, 
by activating pathways that release nitric oxide, helping to maintain vascular tone or, or caliber or size, and thereby preventing or helping prevent hypertension. The glycocalyx also restricts permeability to plasma proteins. So in other words, making sure that proteins like albumin stay in the blood rather than leaking out of the blood vessel. By doing that, it helps prevent edema. Edema is that dis, uh, that uncomfortable phenomenon of when you'll have a limb, for example, start to swell because you're retaining too much water. That's actually a function of water leaving the blood vessels and accumulating in the space outside the blood vessel. Well, the glycocalyx helps keep those proteins in. And if the proteins are staying in the blood, the water is going to be more likely to stay in the blood. And then finally, the glycocalyx also creates a lubrication layer for efficient blood flow by repelling the erythrocytes through the net. Um, so again, it's helping make sure that the red blood cells are just staying in the blood and moving well, not aggregating or clumping together. But of course, no surprise, if the glycocalyx starts to experience some degradation, which as I noted, can be triggered by oxidative stress, it can be triggered by disturbed blood flow in certain areas, but also metabolic factors like hyperglycemia and consequences of hyperglycemia, namely the formation of advanced glycation end products or ages, all of which not only can compromise the glycocalyx, but interestingly play a role in atherogenesis, the most famous of all blood vessel problems. Acute hyperglycemia, for instance, has been shown in healthy adults to reduce the uh, systemic uh, endothelial glycocalyx volume by roughly half. So you take the glycocalyx of a healthy individual, induce hyperglycemia, and it will have shrunk by about half. So that can then lead to a state that is more likely to promote coagulation of the red blood vessels, as well as infiltration of white blood vessel of white blood cells or immune cells into the walls of the endothelium.